Repentance is different from, from confession. Absolutely. We can go before God and say, I'm sorry because I did this and that. But at the end of that prayer, all you did was say what you did. But true repentance is a change of heart and a change of ways. And for as long as your repentance hasn't been changing you, you're still going back to the same things over and over. You've just been confessing. It is time for repentance. A genuine repentance of, this is who I've been up until this point, but this is not who I want to be tomorrow. I want to be better. I want to be a vessel that will be used by God. And I think that's where it begins. And then from there, once that has been settled with God, you are now ready to be given your purpose. Welcome back, boss. We're here to film episode four of Two Men Breaking Bread. It's been a wonderful journey so far. As we've recorded the first three episodes, I think we've all began to think even more about some of the topics we've been discussing. And some of the feedback we've already received on the first three episodes has been really humbling for me personally, just to see that what we thought would just be a conversation between us two turns out it's exactly what people are thinking, what people are wondering, and it's been a help to all the feedback I've been getting so far about the first three episodes. People love it. People want more of that, and they want to have more of these discussions as well. And it's been really, really good to hear. Uh, what have you heard maybe on your side? We have uh, definitely been on uncharted territory for me because I haven't done this before. And with every episode, it seems like it's getting easier and uh, I'm getting a little more in my comfort zone and things are flowing more fluidly. It's it's no longer trying to figure out how things are working. Now we have figured out how things are working and now we're actually beginning to have the conversations. Although we are still missing the bread, but uh, that that's a whole other issue. Uh, the feedback, people have enjoyed the, the first episode. That's I think that's what most people have had a chance to listen to at this point, and it's been uh, pretty well re received. And I hope that uh, as we continue to discuss these things that sometimes we ourselves take for granted, sometimes we may think it's just trivial information and no one is going to use it. As we discuss it, these things uh God will give us the grace to understand them better and to also help his children who uh, may be struggling with some of these topics in their journey. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And last time we were here when we were filming episode three, we discussed a very important question, a question that most people ask in life. Who am I? It all has to do with identity. And it's something that we struggle with so much, just identifying who we are as we covered a little bit, and I won't go back into depth, but some of the things we covered is at times it's so easy to identify yourself with your credentials or with the things you've attained or acquired in life. But when God made man, he never gave him credentials. He simply made him in his image, a son. He was looking for someone that would resemble him. So before there was even credentials, before there was status quo, before there was positions or authorities, man still had an identity. And it seems as though over the years, we tend to lose our identity more and more. And so in life, we're trying to figure out who we are. We're trying to make our way of life and just come up with our identity of who we want to be. And that's what we discussed last time. And today I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to go into perhaps life's biggest question. What is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is my purpose in life? It's a question personally that I find we're asking more of today than we did in previous centuries. And I don't know if it's because of the increase in knowledge over the years. The more we know, the more we seem to also not know. So I find that over, I would say, maybe the last 200 years or 150 years, that question has even been more asked than before. What is my purpose on earth? And I think it's a big question that maybe let's just try and discuss today and maybe can help somebody. Yeah, yeah. as you said, it's, a, it's the question of life. It's a question that we all face at some point in life. Some people face that question at a younger age, others at a later age. But ultimately, we have to address the question of why am I here on earth? Uh, why am I here on earth actually is what life is. 
because what life is to me is different from what life is to you. Understanding why I am here gives me a purpose, and that is what ends up defining my life at the end of it. I uh, think of the Apostle Paul when he's writing to Timothy in uh, his second epistle uh, to Timothy. I think it's in chapter 4, verse 7, where he tells uh, Timothy that I have fought the good fight. I have not given up the faith. So the Apostle is relating purpose to that good fight. And uh, the good fight, as we speak about it, is not a fight like a boxer in a ring fighting a fight, but it's actually a fight fulfilling your purpose. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many things that are trying to drag you away from your purpose in life. Uh, we call them noises in life. There are so many voices in this world. Uh, some of them are intellectual voices trying to reason and define what life is for others. And some of them are religious voices, uh, religion calling you to a certain way of life. And uh, some of them are spiritual voices calling you to a certain um, dimension of life. But ultimately, the purpose of life is something that only the maker can give the creature. You don't see a microwave telling you, this is what I'm supposed to be. Whoever makes it defines its functionality. And that is what we consider the normal usage of the thing. So when we say something is abnormal, what we mean is it's away from what it's supposed to be. And so understanding who we are defines also our normalcy. Outside of that, outside of our purpose, we are sort of abnormal. And that's where so many of life's struggles are coming from in this generation. Yeah. And one thing you can find in common across humanity, across the globe, doesn't matter which country you go to, which civilization you're in, or which society you're in, there is one thing in common with all the people you'll find. They're all trying to find this meaning to life, what their purpose is. Some do it on an individual level. Others do it on a community level, on a group level, depending on where you are and where you come from. So we know that it is a big question. And many times, especially when you're dealing with the present generation, the younger generation, it's even a question that they seem to be struggling with. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do in school. They don't know what to do for work. They don't know where they want to end up because they're all trying to tie all these things into their purpose. So everything they want to do, they want to make sure it aligns with their purpose. But then the same question comes up every time. How do I know my purpose? And one of the things I've found personally when people ask this question, some people ask with the right intention, but others ask with the wrong intention. And what I mean by that is, there is a person who's asking you, how do I find my purpose? They're looking to you to give them an answer of what their purpose is. And I think that's the wrong intention. I don't think anyone can tell you this is your purpose. Like you just mentioned, only the maker of a product, only the maker of something can give it a purpose. So for another man, another woman to give you your purpose, chances are that's their purpose that they're trying to align with yours. So can we answer that question? How do I find my purpose? Is that a question that we can even answer? And maybe using the Bible, which is, as we've established, is our source of truth. Is that a question that can be answered? Because it seems to not be answered anymore. Society doesn't really give you that answer, where they give you the answer that people want to hear. Your purpose is in what you do. Your purpose is in what you do for work. Your purpose is in what you go to school for. But I believe purpose existed before all these things existed. When God made man in the Garden of Eden, he says, let us make man in our image. So immediately the first understanding we have is God created man because he was looking for something or someone similar to him. He had created the angels already, but nowhere in the Bible do we see that he made the angels in his image. And it's not given for us to know how he made the angels, but for what we do know, when it comes to man, he was looking for someone in his image. And when he makes man, he puts him in the Garden of Eden and he gives him a purpose immediately. To have dominion over the earth, to rule everything under the earth. Heaven was his, but earth is man's. And when we read that, that's the first account of God giving man a purpose. Yes. 
What happens from that point on with the rest of men, the rest of the women that are born? How do they discover their purpose? We have to go back and understand why God put man on earth beyond just creating man. Mm -hmm. If I can try to narrate this in a short form, the Bible begins by telling us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible says God created the heavens, that includes the angelic beings. They are part of that heavens. But the Bible doesn't give us clear details of how long it was or when it took place. But at some point, the Bible in the Old Testament, I believe it's uh, Isaiah who tells us now the story. And uh, he narrates how Satan falls from heaven. And part of that narration tells us that Satan, when he fell from heaven, he fell with uh, a good number of angels from heaven. So these creatures of heaven that were there were created to serve a purpose in heaven because God doesn't create things just for the sake of pleasure. Everything that God created is there to serve a purpose. The Bible says even the wicked for the day of evil. Mm -hmm. So everything God puts on earth is there for a reason. Nothing happens by mistake. When Satan fell from heaven, he came down while well, he was kicked out of heaven. So we can assume he went a level lower. Uh, and uh, Today, I'm not going to talk about this, but I'll just briefly say it, and may, many people may be confused about this, but there are three heavens by the account of the Bible, at minimum three. So the highest of heavens belong to, he to God. That's according to the Bible. So when Satan was kicked out of that the highest of heaven, he went somewhere. And according to the book of Ephesians, he still dwells in the heavenlies. <laughs> so somewhere in another heaven which is not the dimension that we can look at with our eyes. It's, it's, it's not the sky and, and the clouds that we talk about. But on earth, God looked here. There was no man. Mm -hmm. He created a man and he put him here. That is the man that God gave dominion and everything. But fast forward, the devil being evil, he decided to use the serpent. And the story is told in Genesis chapter 3, how he uses the serpent. And through the serpent, he brings about the fall and man is kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Now, we have briefly spoken about this in another uh, one of our episodes. So I'll spare the, the listeners the details. But since man was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, he lost direct access to God. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says that God put uh, cherubims with yeah. flaming swords to protect the way back to the tree of life. Mm -hmm. And by the Bible itself, it says that Jesus is life. So the absence of that connection back to God opened the door for man to sort of navigate life on his own. Mm -hmm. And it also opened the door for man to be influenced by the devil. The meaning of life became crucial as we evolved and the generations passed. I believe the first generations after Adam, they could have gone back to Adam and asked him a few things here and there, and he will give them cues and hints based on what he experienced before the fall. But Genesis chapter 6 comes and tells us a story that uh, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, mm -hmm. you know, there had been a multiplication on earth and they took wives and basically they started li living the way people are living today, just taking women however they want and taking men however they want. The Bible says God flooded the earth because he saw that every inclination of the human heart was evil. So that is beginning to show us that people are deviating from their normal state. People are deviating from what God considers normal about human being. And what is it that God considers normal about human beings? The Bible says when he created man, back to Genesis 1, he looked at him and he said it was good. God went and rested. So if God created something good, then six chapters down in the Bible, they're telling us that every inclination of the heart was evil. Something happened in between. Sin changed man. The sin that happened in Genesis 3 changed man. And as a result, man lost his sense of being. He lost his purpose. He lost his identity. Now he became just a wandering person seeking answers. And those answers, he can only find them when he goes back to the creator. So long story short, how can we find purpose? 
How can we define life? Mm -hmm. All of these are questions that can only be answered when you go back to how things were in the beginning. Mm -hmm. How were things in the beginning? Man was in direct contact with his creator. And that's how he found the meaning of life and his purpose on earth. Yeah. And when you speak about the beginning, let us just go back there for a minute. Because there's something you covered that I want to elaborate a little bit on. After God had created man in his image, we find Adam is on earth. And as you said, he went to rest. But then he also brought all the animals that he had created, all the birds, everything that he had created, to come to Adam so that Adam could give names to these things. And we find immediately, so he didn't make man to be idle. No. He put man in the Garden of Eden to work. And the work he was doing was what he himself, God, would have been doing. But he didn't need to do anymore because he had now made someone in his image. So whatever Adam called the animals, that's the name that it became. Mm -hmm. And God didn't need to double check it. He didn't need to verify it because he had made Adam in his image. So whatever Adam said, whatever Adam did on earth is exactly what God would have done. Yeah. But then somewhere along the way, man was interested in more than just doing God's work and doing God's business. Man desired the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the entrance to losing purpose begins. Yes. The purpose that you were created for Adam was to rule, to reign, to dominate, and to tend to the garden. But now you're seeking for more than that. Mm -hmm. You want the knowledge of good and evil. Do you think maybe that's where the door to a life of a lack of purpose begins? I think so, because if you can define for yourself what is good and what is evil, you are God to yourself. Part of living by the tree of life, part of living by the word of God is it abdicates you from the responsibility of defining what is right and what is wrong. And maybe actually, let's speak on something there, something important as well. God made man in his image, but then when man eats of the fruit, he says, we shouldn't give him access because he'll be like one of us. He'll be like one of us. Yet he had made him in his image. Yes. And this all ties into purpose again. So we're not really, for the listeners, we're not really deviating. It all ties into purpose. <laughs> yes. But maybe for someone who's wondering that question exactly, what was different about being in God's image mm -hmm. and then now God not wanting him to be like him? God knows evil, but God has the power not to do evil. We know evil, but we have no power to keep ourselves from doing evil. The Apostle Paul says, I believe it's in the book of Romans, that the good I want to do, I'm not able to do it. Even when I want to do good, it's evil that's coming out of me. Mm -hmm. So something happened when we ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We inclined towards evil. We became evil. But we are not the devil. Mm -hmm. We took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we ate its fruit. And uh, the Bible actually does say that it was pleasing to the eye and good for the stomach. Mm -hmm. From that moment on, we were attracted to that fruit. We wanted what's evil. Now, we know that anything that God does is good. And what God does not do is not good. It may have an appearance of good, mm -hmm. but it's not good. So the Bible goes on and says that there is a way which seems right unto a man, mm -hmm. but the end of it is death. Yeah. I think in my understanding of that, it's the way of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you begin to judge for yourself what is good and evil, you will end up in death. Because what we consider good, God looks at it and says, I don't like that. Then Revelation tells us another thing. He says, when uh, there was a book in the, in the hand of, uh, of the one who was seated on the throne, and uh, they were looking for someone who could open the book, mm -hmm. no one was found worthy. Mm -hmm. So although we have the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, we are unworthy to redeem ourselves. So it shows you here that eating from this tree made us less How did it make us less? We were already less to begin with, because Psalms tells us that what is man that you made him a little lower than angels? So we were a little lower than angels. I believe that's in Psalms chapter 8. Mm -hmm. We were lower than angels. Yeah. Angels are lower than God. So everything that God created is on a scale. They go from high to 
there's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy. You go from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Man is somewhere in there. We we are a little higher than certain animals, but we are definitely below angels according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. In power. Yeah. So when man sinned, he realized that he had a uh, a wall around him. He had a covering around him, and that was God's protection, God's presence. He lost it. When he lost it, he began to look at himself in this hierarchy. So he used to live at the top because of God. Now you look at yourself where you are. The fear of animals comes in. The fear of death comes in. Sicknesses, diseases come in, as well as what is this life that I'm now living? Mm -hmm. Why am I here? What is the end of my life? All of those questions now demand answers. And that's where we get a lot of our depression from. Yeah. And Adam didn't have those questions before the fall because he was still connected to God himself. Yeah. So he still heard God's voice. You know, even after the fall, we see that the Bible tells us, and they heard God walking in the cool of day. So they were used to hearing God. This wasn't a strange appearance to them. They were used to hearing God's voice. But after the fall... And after he proclaims his judgment upon man and the earth, we find that disconnect. We don't find any record of God speaking to Adam again. Mm -hmm. We don't actually find any record of communication between man and God until the sons of Seth begin to call on God. Mm -hmm. Around the time of Seth's birth, people begin to call on God again. Now, there was a man of God who lived some time back who said that any time God speaks to a man, he gives him purpose. And when I read that, I think that's one of the most truest things you can ever believe. Yeah. When God speaks to you, he gives you purpose. And that's what happened with Adam. When God was speaking to Adam, Adam had a purpose. When God stopped speaking to Adam, Adam lost his purpose. So he needed to find a way back again for God to give him purpose. Uh -huh. And we see that even throughout his sons. Cain, God proclaims his word to him, his judgment after he has killed his brother. He makes him a wanderer. He is forever to wander the fields, wander the earth. He loses purpose. But even in his losing purpose, the fact that God spoke to him, his purpose is he will wander the earth for yes. the rest of time. Yes. And we find that again all throughout the Bible. Anytime God comes down and speaks to a man, a man or a woman that he wants to use, there is purpose that is given. Yeah. And for as long as that person obeys and walks in obedience to what has been, they have been told, purpose is there. But when there is no voice, there is no insight from God to, to a person, it seems that there is no purpose. What do you think about that? It's true. And the Bible says that heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God shall never pass away. Mm -hmm. So when God speaks, that's his word. And in his word, we find purpose. Now, to use an illustration, an example, look at Jesus, when he was on earth, he found Peter fishing and he told Peter, you have a profession, you are a fisherman, but now come, I'll give you a purpose. Because as a fisherman, a professional fisherman, you are getting paid, you can feed yourself, but you're not doing what I called you to be. You have been called to be a fisherman of men, not of fish. Same thing with Paul, before he, uh, Saul, in the, in the case before he was converted, he was persecuting the church. He was zealous for God, but under the wrong understanding. And when he met Christ, he converted him. He gave him a purpose. So when a man meets God and he hears from God, he receives a purpose. And there's so many examples of that in the Bible. Exactly. Moses. Yes. A lot of men. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to hear from God to get a purpose. Mm -hmm. If you come to me, like you said earlier on, if you come to me and you ask me, what is my purpose? I'm struggling to find and understand my purpose. How can I tell you your purpose? It's impossible for a blind man to lead a blind man and expect both of them to get to their destination. So we shouldn't go to men to get our purpose from them. Anything that you get from men will fail at some point. What you get from God is what is infallible. And we should only trust God because he's the source of truth. He said, let every man be false and God be true. Mm -hmm. So if God says something, you can rest your faith there. You can put assurances in it because he said he is true and every man be a liar. Mm -hmm. That means including what people say about you. You are this, you are that. 
If it's contrary to what God said about you, it's a lie. What God said is the only truth you can rest your life on. Yeah. And I think it's something that we have to do. We really have to do, especially when you look at the way life is going, the way just even the crime rate all over the world. Man's inclination, as you said earlier, is always going to be towards evil. And any time you see people turning more and more towards evil, it just tells you these are people who have forgotten their purpose. They don't know their purpose. And if you haven't asked yourself that question, I don't think there is any anything such as I am too young to ask that question. I think the earlier you ask yourself, do I know my purpose in life, the better life you're going to have in the long run. Yes. Because it would be one thing if you're 50 and maybe you are in that position and you're asking that question at that point, what is my purpose in life? There's already a big part of your life you've already missed because every day you're not fulfilling your purpose is a day you're fulfilling someone else's purpose. Correct. We go to work, we go to school, we do all these things in life. But have we ever asked ourselves, in all the things I'm doing, am I fulfilling my purpose? Because if you're not, it means you're fulfilling someone else's purpose. Now, yes. God forbid that other person's purpose ends up being the devil's purpose. It could be that you're living life fulfilling the devil's purpose. And yeah. it sounds scary. Yeah. It sounds scary. It's something people don't want to hear, but it's the honest truth. And you have to be honest with yourself to ask that question. Whenever you see something popular, whenever you see something that everybody tends to do, you can rest assured it's not God's way of doing that thing. So if you see the, the world back in the days, before the current educational system, people used to follow in the footsteps of their fathers. And uh, we got to a point where it was insufficient. We developed a new system, and that is what has developed into what we have today, our present educational system. And the promise of this system is to give you the leaders of tomorrow. But I think they have failed at that. I, I don't think you can transform people into their purpose. You can only teach people and you can influence people. But for someone to actually get their purpose, they have to return to their maker because there are things that are built in you. And those things are there for a simple reason of serving the purpose that God has given you in life. So if, if for instance, you use an example of a, a man that God calls to serve as a prophet. In the Old Testament, the Bible says whenever people needed to inquire from God, they will go to the prophets, the seers, and they will uh, inquire from them. Now, these prophets, from the outside, they appeared like anybody else. But in their making, you will notice that they are strange people. Whenever you're dealing with prophets in the Old Testament, they had the ability to go to heaven and be on earth at the same time. So if I can, I can use maybe, a, for lack of better words, it's like they could live in two dimensions at the same time, in eternity and in time. And such men are born like that. And that's what God tells Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb of your mother, I, I called you. I knew you and I called you to be a prophet. Mm -hmm. So I made you that way. So if Jeremiah tries to live any other life, he will not succeed. He can have success in some aspects, but he will not succeed because he's making, he's, the ingredients in him have been uh, fine-tuned for the specific purpose that God has put him on earth for. And it's like you were saying the other day that when you manufacture something, when you make something, only the person who has made it can give it a purpose. Other people may land upon it. They may, for example, the person who made a fork, he gets to define what a fork's purpose is. Someone else may land on the fork, but if they don't know the purpose of that fork, they will misuse it because the one who made it knows exactly what it's capable of. He knows that if, if you bend it too much, it'll break. But if you hold it in one hand, you can use it to eat. And it's the same way with mankind. God is our maker. Therefore, he knows what we're capable of. And he knows what purpose he created us for. And it leads us into something else that's very important. If God is the one who gives man purpose, that means that he has a stake in your purpose. Yes. He has a benefit in your purpose because he's the one giving you that purpose. And I don't think for a second that when God gives life, because all life comes from God, when a child is born, that life came from God. There is nowhere else that life can come from. I don't believe for a second that any life on earth that has been given by God 
was made for the purpose of just living life without God included in that life. No. I think it's very dangerous when you begin to live life and everything you do or you believe you found your purpose, but your purpose doesn't give glory to God. That's the definition of, of uh, ingratitude. Someone gave you life. Someone pumps the breath of life into you every single day. And if it decides to withdraw it, there is nothing you can do about it. Mm. There is no machine that will keep you alive past the date that God says you will die. You'll start rotting. Mm -hmm. Yet, it seems like the thank you note that we give God is to live our life and just tell him goodbye until I'm about to die. You cannot live life and say, I won't go to God and ask him for a purpose. Then at the end, expect him to judge you and expect to pass the evaluation. He will only evaluate you based on what he preordained you to be. So, so many times we are feeling inadequate. We are feeling uh, insufficient because what God has called us to do is the last thing we think about. In fact, I'm even giving people more leniency here. Many people don't even think about God. They go through life looking at the systems of the world to define their purpose. And sometimes it works to a degree. And by that I mean, for some people, they may have a gift and they utilize it and they find success with that gift. But you can use the gift the wrong way. If a gift does not glorify God, you're using it the wrong way. So you can have, for instance, a gift of singing or playing a musical instrument. God told Moses when they were leaving uh, Egypt to go in Israel, after he gave him the design of uh, the Ark of the Covenant and uh, the whole uh, uh, inner court and outer court of the, 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 the tent, he told, uh, he told Moses, among the Israelites, there are people that have given gift talents, artisanal talents, so that they can craft these things. God needed them in that moment. Now imagine God needs you to utilize something that he has given you but you're unavailable to do it. That's a problem. That's on one hand. Now, there is another hand to this. The Bible says we received freely and we shall give freely. Mm -hmm. There are people who have found their purpose. They monetize it. Now, I'm not going to talk so much about that because a man you know, must eat at the sweat of his forehead. There is room to monetize whatever you're doing. There is room to eat you know, I think there is even a scripture that says you shall not deny an ox mm -hmm. uh, food when it's uh, plowing the field. Yes, but the mistakes that we make is when money becomes the priority. So we are no longer serving God. Now we are serving money. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. That is very true. Yeah. And when you look at life right now for th those who are still struggling to find their purpose, and it's it's a natural struggle, by the way. When I say this, it doesn't mean that everybody must have it figured out. Because if it's big enough of a question that it's being asked all over the world, it means that there is some difficulty in finding a purpose. Now, what are some of the dangers of living life without knowing your purpose? A directionless life where, like we saw, you become a wanderer. What is the danger in going going on about life? You know, there's people that live life in... Life will be what it will be. Life will happen as it is. What is the danger in that? Yeah, so to answer the question of the dangers of uh, living a life without a purpose, I will uh, use a saying, and uh, there's a saying in the world that says, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Mm -hmm. One of the dangers of living a life without a purpose is to live a life without a purpose. And you can imitate other people's purpose. But still, you will find no satisfaction in that. And then another thing is you will never achieve your true potential unless you're walking in the purpose that God has called you to be in. So Jesus Christ, he says something interesting in the book of John chapter 17, verse 4. Jesus Christ says, he's speaking about glorifying God. And then he says here at the end, uh, he says here, I, uh, verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So that line, when I read it the other day, not knowing that we'll be talking about purpose, but I was thinking about this because everything that God put on earth is for his glory. And then Jesus says, I have glorified you by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So if you live a life where you don't have a purpose, 
First of all, you won't know the work that you were called to do. Secondly, you won't glorify God. And if you don't glorify God with your life, who are you glorifying? Wow. So you'll live a life where you will never satisfied. You'll find no pleasure in that life. You're always hoping from one to another because there is no satisfaction in those things. It seems like you're chasing the wind and you can never catch it because you are always running after things that are not the thing. Now, you can do something right, but it doesn't mean that you're doing the right thing. There is a difference between doing something right and doing the right thing in life. You can do something that is right, but it's the wrong thing for you. And most of the sins in the world, if you think about it, they're like that. Every sin that you see in the world, whatever we consider a sin today, is good that is perverted. With that same mindset, if you do not understand your purpose, you are living a life where you can take someone else's purpose. It may be good for them, but for you it's evil. Mm. And that's why we should not copy one another. Yeah. And I think that's why it's the danger in that also is you put an unneeded stress and pressure on yourself because you don't know your purpose. Now you're looking to others. What are others doing? You're trying to imitate what others are doing. This guy is doing this thing. He has success. Maybe I can do the same thing and have success. But purpose isn't about success, at least not in the way we think it is. I don't believe that God's purpose for anyone is to make money. Not to say money is wrong. Money helps us do things that we need to do. It helps us survive. It helps us live. But when we don't know what our purpose is and we try to align our purpose with what society tells us, with what culture tells us, with what our family tells us, there's a lot of unneeded pressure and stress we put on ourselves. And when we don't live up to that purpose that we've been told by society, we've been told by the groups we're in, then we feel this, this lack of fulfillment. We feel like we're not whole. Because we're trying to be what somebody else has envisioned for us, mm -hmm. but we can't live up to that standard. We can't live up to that purpose, or it doesn't work the same way that it was advertised. So we feel like maybe there's something wrong with us. But the problem isn't that there is something wrong with you. I think the problem is you're trying to live up to somebody else's purpose, and yes. that's very dangerous. It, we need to go back to what you were saying before, going back to our maker and really asking that question, what is my purpose? Now, since we're already speaking about that, that journey of going back to God and asking him, what is my purpose? Let's talk about that journey. What does that journey look like? What, what does a person do? Because a lot of people want step-by-step -step guides. Yes. And we can't deny people wow. of that. It, it's, we live in an age where people want the how-to. Mm -hmm. That's why there's so many how-to books, how to do this, how to do that. How does one take that journey of discovering purpose back to God? I think God has equipped us with the, everything that we need for the journey. Mm -hmm. He has also equipped us with the ability to understand using our minds. But there is something that is lacking. It's the connection between our inner being and God. I am of the opinion, based on the Bible, that man is a triune being. You have the outer compartment, which is the flesh, and uh, you have the uh, inner compartment, which is the soul. And then you have the innermost compartment, which is the spirit. When God is communicating or communing with man, he does it from inside going outwards. So the fellowship between man and God takes place in the spirit. No wonder Jesus came and said, the father is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Those are the two requirements to have this worship with God. When I speak about worship, I'm not speaking about what you used to in church. There is a choir there that leads the worship team, or they lead the worship service. That's not worship. If the Father is seeking worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, that means you can worship Him anywhere. You don't have to be in church to worship Him, because what is worship at the end of the day? Worship is this offering of one's self as a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. That is the worship that we speak about. The praises that we offer in church are part of that. But the true worship, according to the book of Romans, is to offer ourselves. As a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. This offering of ourselves, the Bible says you should do it in spirit and in truth. So don't hang yourself on the cross and say, I'm offering myself. That's, that's not it. But 
what is the in spirit part? The in spirit part is actually done through the resurrection of our spirits from death to life. The Bible says, if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal bodies. How is it going to quicken our mortal bodies? We are alive. If, if you think about it, we are currently alive. What is it going to quicken then? That quickening part is our spirit. Because the Bible in another part of it says, we were once dead in our trespasses. We were once in the past, we were dead, but now we have been brought to life. Mm -hmm. But again, what is the Bible talking about? The Bible is talking about the state of our spirits. Because we were created in the image of God, we are spirit beings who have flesh. And that flesh is what we use to communicate with the world. But we use the spirit to communicate with God. So how do you find this purpose with God? How do you go back to God and address that question of, Lord, I want to know my purpose? I think I know of one way only. It's through Calvary. You cannot meet God on your merits. It will never work. As on our merits, we are sinners. God is holy. No one can see God and survive that. You will die because of his holiness. They are angels, like uh, the Bible calls them, uh, I think the cherubims. They are there to protect the presence of God. From who? From sinners, intruders like us. So if any man tries to go in the presence of God with their sins... You will die. In the Old Testament, um, the sons of Aaron, they tried to go to the innermost part of the uh, tabernacle. And the Bible says they died. Mm -hmm. Now today, a way has been provided. That way is through Calvary, the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only way back to God. Any other way is not God's provided way. It will result in death. We can tie this back to the whole issue of religion. Religion tends to substitute Calvary instead of helping people find Calvary. If, you, if your religion does not lead you through Calvary and Pentecost afterwards, you are lacking something in your religion. The way to Pentecost, the way to the upper room is through Calvary. So any religion that tries to omit that step of going to Calvary first is useless because where else are you going to find the blood of Jesus Christ to have the way back to the Father? You're lacking something. We may have saints so-and-so. We may have all of these people we can call and intercede on. But we know that the Bible says there is only one intercessor between God and man. It's the man, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he told us we must take up our own crosses and follow him. So the beginning of the journey is find Calvary first. What is Calvary? It's the death and resurrection with Jesus Christ. Not of Jesus Christ alone, with him. Mm -hmm. We must die to our old self and resurrect to the new creature in Christ. The old things have passed, now all things are new. These are all scriptures I'm trying to put out there to help someone who doesn't know, someone who wants to know their ABCs of the Bible. There is only one way, die and resurrect to Jesus Christ first, then the channel of communication between us and the Father will be open. And to summarize that, it is the way of repentance. That's the first step. Because Calvary is all about that blood of Jesus Christ. It means that there was something, there is something wrong with where we are and who we are at this point. We need his blood to wash us. And that is so important because what comes after can't happen until you've gone through the washing, the cleansing, the purification that happens, the rebirth that happens at Calvary. Because up until this point, if you're asking that question, what is my purpose? Up until this point, you have not been living your purpose. You have been living someone else's purpose. Now you're asking God to reveal to you what his purpose for you is. And think of yourself in this moment as a vessel. You know, when you have a pot, for example, and it's been used in the kitchen, it's been filled with whatever. You cannot use it again to make something new until you first wash it. Uh -huh. And I think that's what happens with mankind at Calvary. Up until this point, you have been used, you have been used for somebody else's purpose. You can think of it negatively or positively, however you want to think about it, but up until this point, you haven't been fully given over to Christ to fulfill his purpose. So now what you're doing at Calvary, you're being washed by his blood. Remember the pot we talked about? 
you're being washed so that you can now be used for what comes next. Because God won't use the current state of you, the current yeah. version of you. He needs to first wash you, form you, and then now you're ready to fulfill his purpose. Yeah. And that's what that first step is, repentance. So if I'm in that position where I want to discover my purpose with God, that is the first step we would take. Yes. Begin by repentance. And that prayer of repentance needs to be genuine. Because repentance is different from from confession. Absolutely. We can go before God and say, I'm sorry because I did this and that. But at the end of that prayer, all you did was say what you did. But true repentance is a change of heart and a change of ways. And for as long as your repentance hasn't been changing you, you're still going back to the same things over and over. You've just been confessing. It is time for repentance. A genuine repentance of, this is who I've been up until this point. But this is not who I want to be tomorrow. I want to be better. I want to be a vessel that will be used by God. And I think that's where it begins. And then from there, once that has been settled with God, you are now ready to be given your purpose. It's very important that repentance, as you've said it, it's very important to know that confession does not change. It's repentance. It's that change in heart. That change in heart opens many doors. It opens many ways between man and his creator. Now, after Calvary, as I I was illustrating earlier, the channel between man and his creator is open. Now you can have this communion, Mm -hmm. this fellowship in spirit between God and self. You will experience what Jesus experienced. In my understanding of the four gospels of of, uh, the disciples, as they were narrating to us the life of Jesus Christ. At no point does the Bible record Jesus having a conversation with the Father, Mm -hmm. with the Father in the form of the Father speaking to him. Mm -hmm. And Jesus speaks to God in prayer. Uh, He addresses him, as we read in John 17. But at no point does God speak back to him, and it's recorded to us. Mm -hmm. God spoke and spoke to the disciples, I believe, on Mount Transfiguration but he was not addressing Jesus. So Jesus then gives us the reason why. One day he says, I do not do my own will. I do that which I see the Father doing. So him and God, they live so close together that when God wants to do something on earth, Jesus is available. He sees it and he goes and executes it. That puts a man in his purpose. Right there, that is the life we ought to live where you do what God wants to be done on earth. And then Jesus told us the same thing. Not only is that lifestyle for himself, but then he tells us when we pray, one of the lines in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples is, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is powerful. Nothing can absurd the power of God. But God also walks by certain laws that bind him. One of them is he gave this earth to man and he gave him dominion over it. There are things God cannot do on earth without the cooperation of man. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, he needs man to do that. And part of our presence here on earth is to cooperate with him in fulfilling his will here on earth. Mm -hmm. But how are we going to understand his will unless he can speak to us? This is the reason why we begin by saying repentance, the way of Calvary first, so you can be able to communicate with God. After you are able to communicate with God, then he can tell you what he wants you to do. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why are we praying for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? Well, I can answer that by taking you back to the book of 1 Kings, I believe it's chapter 18, where God tells Elijah, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain down on the earth. Well, the Bible also tells us that it's Elijah who spoke and there was no rain. Mm -hmm. Why is God now saying, go present yourself again so I can send rain? See, although Elijah was the one doing the speaking, he was only speaking what God's will was. And that brings something else that's important. No matter how much you pray, if God is not willing to do it, your prayers cannot force him to do it. So Elijah presented himself to Ahab and he said, there shall not be rain until I speak again. Mm -hmm. Then we hear God say, let him go and present himself again and I will send rain. 
But when you read further down in that chapter, you will notice the travail that Elijah had to go through for rain to come. Mm-hmm. I think that he, he had to put himself in a certain position like... Uh, his head between his his legs. seven yeah. hands. He was praying, but God said, I'll send rain. Mm-hmm. Why pray for something that God has said? So you see, your prayer now is putting you back in the purpose of God. Mm-hmm. And that's how God wants to cooperate, to work with us so we can live a purposeful life here on earth. Mm-hmm. And I think you've just introduced the notion of partnership with God. And that's what God's will really is. As you said, God will do nothing on earth without man. Not that he can't, because he's all powerful. He doesn't need man to do anything. But he chooses not to do things on earth without the involvement of man. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to the position he had given man in the beginning, that the earth was man's. And although man forgot their position and authority, God still remembers it. God still knows it. And he chooses to follow that structure when he's working on earth. And I think when we realize that, then you'll also realize that we were made for more than what we do and what we know right now. Yes. When you look at the average life of a person or a person who claims that they know God or they were made by God, that average life, I believe, is not the life that God called that person to live. I believe God called us and made us to be more than what we are right now. Yes. To do more than what we're doing right now. But somewhere along the way, we settled for what's normal. We settled for what's socially accepted. We settled for the norms that society had given us, and we forgot that we were made for more. I don't believe that God called people to live the average life that everybody else is living. Because if you're a God-called people, you should be living in a higher realm, a higher dimension than the average person. Because as we've said, exactly. And if you are made in His image, The image of God, as you mentioned, is in the spirit. But we find that many times we're living life on the realm of the flesh. We haven't even began to really experience the higher dimensions of life beyond the flesh. Because it is possible to live on earth, like you said, but also live in heaven at the same time. And maybe that'll be a discussion for another time. But are we really not living the lives God has called us to live? As in, we were made for more. Because when I look at my life, there was a point in my life personally, I was wondering, what can I do for God? What more can I do for God? I was already in the ministry. I was already preaching. I was already helping beyond the ministry. But that question, and even to this day, every day, I believe it's a question you should always ask yourself. What more can I do for God? Because if you reach a point where you don't think there is more you can do for God, that means your purpose has come to an end. Yes. But for as long as you're still alive, I believe your purpose hasn't come to an end. So there is still more you can do for God. Yes. So the one thing I would highlight from what you have said there, if you are living an average life, you're not living with God. I know it sounds very radical when you say it like that, but God actually did tell Israel, if you read in the book of Deuteronomy, I believe it's in chapter 28, If you obey me and follow my commands, these are the blessings that are going to follow you. He never revoked those blessings. They still apply to us, Israel, spiritually. And one of those is you shall be first and not last. You shall be the head and not the tail. You shall plant and have a harvest. You shall be enjoying last year's harvest when you collect this harvest. What is God trying to show us? You won't live an average life. And by us saying that, I don't want people to think that we're here to preach a prosperity gospel. Because far from that. Far from that. <laughs> yeah. That is not what we're here to do. And many people actually use that same scripture that you have just quoted there to preach the prosperity gospel. But I believe the more that we're talking about, the more that God has called you to live, has nothing to do with prosperity. On Absolutely. Earth. Because if you look at Adam and you trace his lineage, the lineage of Seth, the Bible in Genesis gives us a comparison. They do a lineage of... Seth, and then they also do a lineage of Cain and his sons, what happened to them. You will actually find that prosperity was in the lineage of Cain. Mm -hmm. Prosperity in the sense of earthly prosperity was not in the in the lineage of Seth, but yet they had a different kind of life. And that life was prosperous in a different way. Yes. And so maybe let's clarify that a little bit. When God says he has called you for more, beyond, if you neglect, if you Put aside money, put aside prosperity, put aside earthly success. Mm -hmm. What more are we talking about there? If you think of Gideon, for instance, in the Bible, Gideon was an average boy. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was the least of among his tribe and, you know, the, the, the rest of the story in the book of Judges. But he was living an average life. 
like every other person, but that's because he had not yet met God. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to him, he asked him, if God is with us, where are the miracles? In other words, if God is with us, why are we average? Why, in fact, in this case, why are we last? It goes to show that although preachers abuse these scriptures and use them to harass their congregation into giving them money, it is wrong. But it also doesn't mean you will live an average life. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us Enoch walked with God and he was seen no more. That's not an average life. Yeah. That's a life of a man who was successful until one day God said, you are, you are too good to be on earth. I want you to be with me. Come to my side. He was taken up and was not seen anymore. Mm -hmm. There are people like Elijah. They performed so many wonders until one day God says, you, I won't let you see death. He took him up to heaven. That is the kind of life I'm talking about. Uh, it's in the book of Daniel, I believe, in chapter 11, verse 32, I could, if I remember correctly, where the Bible says, the people that know their God shall do exploits. Mm -hmm. If you know your God, you shall do exploits. That is to show that when we are living an average life, somewhere our knowledge of our God is wrong. Mm -hmm. Where are the exploits? Today, some of the People who suffer a lot with sicknesses are the same people who claim to believe in God. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, or I'm not saying that's not ordinary. What I'm saying is this. In the camp of God, there should be miracles. In the camp of God, there should be wonders. And by those wonders, I don't mean you go out there and do the spectacles that we see sometimes on, with the, some of the preachers out there, you know, throwing people down. Those are not wonders. Because even the beast was given power to perform wonders. By wonders, I actually mean, can the kingdom of God still influence this world the way the apostles of the early church did influence the world? Mm -hmm. Those are the wonders I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And you're referring to the supernatural. The supernatural. Mm -hmm. Men who could travel distances in a blink of an eye in the case of Philip. You know, th those are the miracles I'm talking about. The Bible speaks of wonders that the apostles did, healing the sick. They performed many wonders. And among those wonders also, the biggest miracle that you can see is conversion. Someone who did not know Christ actually being converted and giving their life to Christ. That to me is the biggest miracle. Why is it that today we are failing to have conversions? I think even not just conversion, but even to re reproduce the same works that the Bible tells us we should be able to produce. Jesus Christ said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And then he lists many supernatural workings that will follow the believer. I was thinking about that today, and I came down to one conclusion. Somewhere along the way, we stopped believing. We started settling. Yes. We stopped believing for more. We started settling for what we had. And if you look at generations, in the past generations, the generations that have come before us, it's even happening more and more up until this day. And I believe it's going to happen even more in the next generation where we stop believing for what is possible. We start settling for what is present. Yes. And that's where we have gone wrong. That is why I personally think the supernatural has lost its place. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are not believing what could be. We are accepting what is. Yes. And that's very dangerous as well. You can't have the supernatural without the superpower. Mm -hmm. And God is the superpower mm -hmm. who performs the supernatural. He's the almighty, all-powerful all God. Mm -hmm. And another thing, I have had a chance to study through history. And, uh, uh, you know, like uh, some of the books that describe the early life of the church believers, you will see what they did and you will see the the... the they, they were not conforming to the norms of their days. And for that reason, they were most of the times uh, persecuted by the state or the, the church in some other times. Today, it's very hard to distinguish between those that claim to follow God and those that claim not to follow God. Mm -hmm. Because God's children are called to live a life that is different. And uh, when you look at, for instance... Uh, servants of God, mighty servants of God. They have lived a different life. If you think of John the Baptist in the Bible, he said, the Bible says he lived in the wilderness and he lived a different life. If you think of Elijah, 
the Bible doesn't introduce Elijah as in like his upbringing. It just says this strange guy came from somewhere, the Tishbite. <laughs> and that's all we know about Elijah. Elisha, something, he was plowing his field one day and Elijah came and threw his coat on him. And that's how we introduced to these people. We don't know so much about them, but we do know one thing. They lived a different life. But today we want to live the life that the average Joe is living and then expect the supernatural. The supernatural requires super effort. It requires work on the part of the believer. We cannot have the same results without putting in the same amount of work. Mm -hmm. But the devil has found a way to rob us of time. There are, I call them demons, for lack of better words. There are spirits that are curtailed to steal the believer's time. Mm -hmm. No wonder the Bible says, I will restore the years that so-and-so, the caterpillars ate, the canker worms, and the locusts. What is God trying to tell us there? Satan comes to rob us of time. So Paul says in, in the Bible, uh, we must redeem time as we see the days getting evil. Mm -hmm. We should do our best to redeem our time to serve God in the purpose for which he created us for, mm -hmm. as we are seeing the days getting evil, mm -hmm. which are our days. And that's how we will be able to live a purposeful life and please God by faith, and by fulfilling the purpose for which he put us here. And it's just as you've said, the supernatural is missing because a lot of men and women have failed to live their purpose. I believe if every man and woman was living their God-given purpose, we would have more of the supernatural today. And it's not to say that it's not happening because if you look all over the earth, there is, there are places, there are people where the supernatural is still present. Yes. And it can be present. It's not just something that's reserved for a certain group of people or a certain class of people. Because these signs shall follow them that believe. The only prerequisite is to believe. But we are not doing these things because we've foregone in our God-given purpose. We're walking in our man-given purpose. The purpose we've given ourselves. The life we've chosen for ourselves. The jobs we've given ourselves. And I think it's about time that people really had that wake-up call. That you're not going to gain any more time, as you've said. Time is only coming to an end. It's only, your time is only being taken away. You don't know how much time you have left on earth. But whatever time you may have left, think about that. Today, as we wrap up, that's something that, a message that we can give to the people. Think about the time you have left on earth. Who are you going to give that time to? Are you going to give that time to someone else's purpose, someone else's vision? Or are you going to give that time to the one who made you, the one who put you, you here on earth, the one who still keeps your heart beating and pumping, like you mentioned earlier. Because if you're not giving that time to the one who made you, ask yourself, what if that being, that God decides to pull away his hand from your life? You're not fulfilling your purpose, so therefore I pull back my support, I pull back. And I believe there's a scripture that says, every tree that doesn't produce the right fruits, I could be misquoting it, it will be taken to the fire. That is speaking of people. Any person that isn't fulfilling the God-given purpose, it's only a matter of time before they're taken away from the earth. Yes. And more are brought in so that God is looking for those who will fulfill his purpose. As a, as a child of God, it's only right that you seek the will of God in everything that you do. God's will will redirect you into his purpose. So as a child of God, whatever you do, seek for the will of God first. Without the will of God, you're walking in the will of a man or in the will of the devil. Mm -hmm. The devil also has his will for the children of God. Mm -hmm. And it's a constant battle. But we must make sure that our obedience, we yield ourselves to the will of God. So as a child of God, we have to find the will of God in our lives. Mm -hmm. Once we find the will of God, we will please God. And when we please Him, one of the promises that he gave us is long life. So we can enjoy life here on earth because we, he, God, is getting something in return. Those are the fruits that he is getting out of us. And he will expect even more, even more, even more. But when he comes, and a scripture just came to my mind, it's, it's the story of Jesus walking. And he saw a tree, a fig tree, and he was expecting to find figs on it. But the Bible bears record that it was out of season. Jesus looked at it, the Bible says he cursed it. Now that tree, if we can think 
for a second here. Just think of that tree as a human being. That tree was not in its season to give fruits. So there is nothing wrong with the tree. It's not its season. But the problem that Jesus had with it, it gave an appearance of something that it was not. You give an appearance of having fruits from far. But when I draw closer, I realize that I was deceived. So I cursed the tree. That's on one hand. On the other hand, Paul tells Timothy, you be ready in season and out of season. So there is no escaping as a believer to say that, oh, I have my seasons. This is not one of my seasons. You have to be ready any moment. Otherwise, you will have an appearance of what you are not. And the dangers of that is you risk being cursed. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus said also. I must do the works of the one that sent me while it is still day. Because there comes and night cometh where no man will be able to work. Yes. It's the same thing. That's very true. And it's unfortunate to see the state that really the enemy has convinced us that this is normal. This is okay. Because I believe when we discover our purpose fully, there is so much more that we can do. We have so much potential that we are not yet realizing. And that maybe that's something we can discuss the next time we meet and, and share. What can man do when man has discovered their purpose? What can I do? Because once you've discovered God's purpose, once you've found out his will for your life, you have to now walk in that will. And what can you do in that will? But that maybe will be a discussion for another time. Boss, thank you again for just coming and having this discussion again today. I always find that I learn just as much as I as much as I speak, I'm learning even more just hearing you say some of these things, and it's bringing a lot of things to mind. It's been a really thought-provoking discussion again, and uh, I'm happy to have been here and had this discussion with you, and I pray that we can continue to have more of these and that they can bless the listeners. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to partake in this uh, recording today, and I really enjoyed the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I hope our listeners will be blessed as much as I was blessed today. Mm -hmm. And just to summarize and just to conclude this session, for those who are in that position where you're wanting to find your purpose, we have spoken about a lot of things here today, but your journey is going to be unique from the general journey we've discussed. But the same principles are apply to all. It is time to go back to the way of Calvary, the way of repentance. There is no escaping it. It may be the uncomfortable thing to do. Repentance isn't easy. If it was easy, everybody would be repenting. Repenting is hard because you have to deny yourself of who you are for the sake of who God has called you to be. Not many people are willing to do that. The cross isn't an easy place to be. The three men that won the cross when Jesus was being crucified as one of the three, their attitudes were very different. It's not an easy place to be, but it's a necessary place to be. Because from repentance, from Calvary, then you can really begin to live the life that God has called you to live. And there is no escaping that. And once you begin to live that life from personal experience, there is no better life outside of that. Allow me to finish today with the reading of a scripture. Mm -hmm. out of the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll read the last two verses. And I'm reading Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Here the Bible says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And when we read verse 13, New King James, it doesn't help our average listeners, our English speakers. But when you read uh, NIV, it says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Mm -hmm. We have to do that. We have been called to fear God and to keep all his commandments. Mm -hmm. That, if you don't know your purpose and you're struggling to find it, begin with that. Fear God first and keep his commandments. His commandments are written in the word. How do you fear God? You fear God by having reverence for what he said. Not by being scared of a sword coming and killing you. You fear God by having reverence. Reverence means high esteem, respect for what he said. That is the end of the matter. And that's coming from, from a man who had attained the highest level of wisdom on earth. Thank you. That's a blessed scripture. Thank you again to our listeners for tuning in. We hope that this discussion has been a blessing. But beyond just you listening in, 
It's good to listen, but it's even better to apply. So for our listeners, we hope we can only hope that this would provoke you to ask these questions to yourself, to have that moment in that time of reflection where you can you can go on your knees, you can open your Bible and begin to figure these things out together with God, because that's where true change happens. And that's all we can ask for. Thank you for tuning in.